Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Treasures in Heaven. From all of us at WCAT Radio, we're glad you're with us. I am your host, Dr. William Ailes. Please know that you're invited to call in during the show with your questions and comments. The number is 515-604-9344. After you are connected, enter the code 914 followed by the pound sign. Love to hear from you. The show's title is taken from the book, Treasures in Heaven. It is free on my website, thetimeline.org, and at any time, you are welcome to write me at williamales at thetimeline.org. Well, continuing tonight with our Lent series, tonight's show is titled Lent, Our God. I'd like to read from the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is our God, and this is what we keep deep in our heart and soul as we ever turn to him, especially during this time of Lent. See, this is the true nature of our God as declared by Moses, but it was fully declared by his son, Jesus Christ. And in the very early days of his ministry, he said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Late in his ministry, when he was talking in an exchange with the temple authorities, he said, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John, John the Baptist, came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus often uses the word repent. So his declaration to us is to repent and believe the gospel. And his declaration to those who rejected John the Baptist was, you did not repent. So the core of tonight's show is our God, his nature, and how this relationship develops with us through the words of our Lord and Savior along with the prophets. But we begin with understanding that the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is our God, the Father of our Lord and Savior. This truly would draw us to God. There's nothing to be afraid of when we see God for who he truly is. And this desire that Christ has for us to repent and believe in the gospel is what lines up our heart with God's heart our will with God's will. And he gives us examples of what not to do. And and truly, the temple authorities at the time of the first century are an example of what not to do. And what I'd like to do is, before we get into these two records, uh, one from Matthew, one from Mark, um, where Christ is talking about repenting and the kingdom of God, I'd like to read the definition of the word repent uh, from the concordance that I have, from the Greek. To repent. To change one's mind and purpose. This change is always for the better and denotes a change of moral thought and reflection. Not merely to repent of, 
or to forsake sin, but to change one's mind and apprehensions regarding it. Hence, to repent in a moral and religious sense with the feeling of remorse or sorrow. It is to come to a right understanding, growing wise. This word denotes to reform, to have a genuine change of heart and life from worse to better. That's God's will for us. And in this time of Lent, this is designed to be a time of reflection, a time to really take stock, to look in the mirror. And when we look in the mirror, how do we feel about that? Are we cheating the man in the glass by usurping God in in our life and fulfilling our own desires that are at cross purposes of God? Is that what we see when we look in the mirror? If that's the case, this is the perfect time to say no. If I want my life to be blessed, if I want to live the will of God, this is what it's all about, a true change of heart. Repent and believe the gospel. So, Mark, chapter 1. We're going to look at the text that precedes Christ saying, repent and believe. Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Of course, this is a prophecy about John the Baptist, where it's a declaration. John is the one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight. So John the Baptist is fulfilling this prophecy in carrying out his ministry to set the stage or prepare the runway for the ministry of the Son of God. So in verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all in the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that John prophesied of, of course, is the Holy Spirit that Jesus prophesied of you know, throughout his ministry, and in particular on the day of his ascension, when he said, you shall receive power. The Holy Spirit that we're baptized with endues us with power from on high, but also empowers us to have a change of heart and mind. Continuing in the Gospel of Mark. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Imagine. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. Repent and believe 
in the gospel. Of course, the gospel that Jesus Christ proclaimed, which continued to be proclaimed through the apostles after Christ was seated on the right hand of God, the gospel being the central part of the gospel, being that Jesus is the Son of God, the one prophesied of from Moses to Malachi throughout the entire New Testament, that God did send his Son, that he so loved the world to save us and to give us eternal life. So John the Baptist fulfilled prophecy. Now Jesus will fulfill prophecy And this is the declaration. Repent and believe in the gospel. Change of heart and mind. Turning away from the ways of the world, which are only designed to trap you anyway, toward the light of God, away from spiritual darkness, toward the light of God, so that our hearts can line up with this heart of God that we had read about earlier, as stated by Isaiah. Now, the other scripture that I covered about repentance was from Matthew 21, and I'm going to read that again. And Jesus is in this exchange with the temple authorities. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. That's an example of what not to do, to maintain a rigid state of mind in a preconceived notion that is counter to the light of Jesus Christ. So, here's the record, Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. This is a prophecy that was given to Israel. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus is going to do in fulfillment of prophecy. The disciples went, and as Jesus had instructed them, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. We get Palm Sunday. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These people recognize this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, when he enters Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. That's a seriously incorrect preconceived agenda counter to the light of God, turning God's house into a den of robbers. 
which, of course, the temple authorities blessed and were fully behind because it was a money machine. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Here we go. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so excited. Nope. They were indignant. Now, being indignant is the definitely incorrect state of mind to have if you're seeking to repent. Being indignant is the fleshly mind of man acting poorly. They saw the wonderful things he did. They saw the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were beside themselves. And this is what they said to Jesus. Do you hear these children, what they are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? In other words, he's trying to tell them this is the fulfillment of prophecy. The fulfillment of prophecy is in your ears. You're staring at the fulfillment of what all your prophets have prophesied about the Messiah. And here's an example that the praise, the worship, Coming from those who recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, Hosanna to the Son of God, is met with disdain by the temple authorities. Certainly not repentance. They didn't repent at John the Baptist. And are certainly not repenting at the wonderful things that they saw Jesus do. So after he cited scripture... And the fulfillment of scripture, he, Jesus, left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. So here the stage is Jesus, as king of the Jews, arrives in Jerusalem in fulfillment of prophecy, riding on a donkey, receiving praise from those who have the heart of a child, if you will, who simply believe the truth that Jesus spoke And then in contrast, we have the temple authorities who rejected the truth that Jesus spoke. So what did Jesus say in his opening ministry? Repent and believe the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Harlots or prostitutes, publicans, tax collectors, they're going into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because they repented And they believed. It's not about the outward appearance. God is always interested in the inward hearts. Always ready to forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. But it's prefaced by a turning to God. You know, during this time of Lent, one of the, I think, personally, the best ways to connect with our Lord and Savior is to go to church when there's nobody there. Silent prayer. Just beholding the cross, the crucifix, taking in what really took place almost 2,000 years ago, God having his own son sacrificed for sin, that our sins could be cleansed by repenting and believing in the gospel that he spoke. So, that was a day at the temple for Jesus, overturning the money changers and receiving obvious praise from those who recognize that Jesus is the Messiah and receiving obvious disdain from the temple authorities. Truth is truth. What we as mankind choose to do with it is entirely up to us. That's the free will our Creator gave us. Now, the record continues. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, 
He went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't just killing trees uh, because he's upset there's no figs there. There's a deeper meaning to this. Israel, in the Old Testament, is the fig tree. That's the symbol. What just happened at the temple? The temple authorities did not receive their king. In fact, they were indignant. Time's up. You, Israel, have rejected your God for the last time. I spoke prophecy being fulfilled in your ears, basically, Jesus said, and you're standing there, tapping your feet with your arms folded, with this very unfortunate look, I'm sure, on your faces if they were indignant. So here, Jesus is on his way back to Jerusalem. Sees a fig tree. There's no fruit on the fig tree. The bigger picture is Israel is not bearing fruit. He cursed the fig tree and it withered immediately. In other words, God is done with the nation of Israel because they have just rejected him to the point where here we are with the Son of God entering as king. That's it. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Of course, it was miraculous, they asked. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So in this situation of the bigger picture of nation of Israel coming to an end in terms of, you know, there's no fruit there. The axe is laid at the roots, as it states in prophecy. There's no fruit left to be had by those who are running the show because they're rejecting the Son of God. Jesus took the situation and turned it into a, an amazing teaching point. Jesus, by his faith, spoke forth and results followed. And he said, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. There is a conviction of the heart, a conviction of the soul, that we as followers of Christ can certainly have. And clearly, what sets the stage for the will of God to manifest in our lives is, of course, we first must repent and believe the gospel. But repenting isn't just a one-time threshold that we cross, because we're still flesh and blood. We're still prone to doing things we wish we didn't, say things we wish we didn't, etc., so there's always a constant recognition of our human frailty, but also a constant recognition of a forgiving God. This is a good way to approach life. Recognize our human frailty. Recognize that God forgives and ask for forgiveness. That's the starting point on which our lives can head down the right path to fulfill the will of God. As we'll read later, to be living epistles or living sacrifices by the way we live our lives. So Jesus gave a teaching point. Have faith and believe. When you pray, believe expecting, with expectant faith. And then he continues. Jesus entered the court temples and 
while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Recall the day before he turned over all the money changers, all the tables were splattered all over, the money went flying, the doves went flying, and the children are saying Hosanna to the highest heaven, to Jesus, doing wonderful things, healing people, and they're saying, by what authority are you doing these things? You know, they're not thrilled. And who gave you this authority? They're, they're looking down their noses at the Son of God. You know, what's going on here? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin. Jesus was a master at answering a question with a question. So here are temple authorities, the chief priests and the elders of the people who are supposed to know what they're doing relative to the Bible. Jesus, of course, referred to them as blind guides. Ask a couple of questions. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? In other words, where do you get off on doing all this and accepting this praise from the people? In other words, who are you? So Jesus responds with, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So he said, it's an if then. If you answer me, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? So, so now, instead of the temple authorities looking for a way to accuse Jesus or trap him in some way, now they're in a trap. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? In other words, if the temple authorities say that John's ministry was from heaven, then Jesus is going to say, well, then why didn't you believe him? Of course, the temple authorities rejected John the Baptist. Now, the temple authorities are still in discussion here. But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they're in a dilemma. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Of course, they're lying to Jesus. Not a, there's another thing not to do. Um, number one, Fail to repent after you see the glory of God. And then two, start lying to the Son of God to cover for your unbelief. In other words, they're doubling down on their position here. Then he, Jesus, said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So they didn't answer him. He didn't answer them. Now he goes on to say, what think you? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. So Jesus is giving them a little parable. Then he gives them yet another question. Which of the two did what his father wanted? Or in other words, which of the two did the father's will? Well, this question 
the temple authorities and the elders can get straight. The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. See, Jesus knew they didn't believe, of course. Jesus knew they were lying to him. You did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. In other words, these people who are looked down upon, the tax collectors and the harlots, repented and believed the gospel. God has no interest in what society thinks of you. It's not about a pecking order. It's about what's in the heart. Why? Because our God is love. God is love. God is light. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus hit these authorities right between the eyes. The people you look down on, temple authorities, they're the ones entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Why? Because they repented and believed John, repented and believed Jesus. And Jesus is not done with these temple authorities, and he's not done with parables. The record continues. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? So now the temple authorities have yet another parable and yet another question from Jesus. So now the temple authorities can again answer correctly, They say, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. These temple authorities walked right into their own words because Jesus is prophesying of them and what's going to happen to them because they have been the tenants of God's vineyard and have failed miserably, killing the prophets God sent to them, and ultimately would kill God's only begotten son, just as the parable states. So after the temple authorities walked into their own words, Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Remember the fig tree? Cursed, withered, died, dead. Kingdom of God will be taken away from the fig tree, Israel, the temple authorities, because there was no fruit there. 
and God's going to give it to a new set of tenants. And guess who that is? If you're listening to this, it's you. We are the ones now in God's vineyard who believe, who repented and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ all these years later. And we are the ones God seeks to produce fruit in his vineyard. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. (laughs) Think about it. They're the big shots of the temple. They're the ones who call the shots. And here's the Son of God issuing two parables. The Pharisees or the Sadducees and the authorities and the elders walked right into their own words, not once but twice basically prophesying of their own demise. So that's why Jesus quoted, have you never read, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of this new living temple made up of people baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a global living temple, and Jesus is the cornerstone that the builders rejected back in the first century. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It certainly is marvelous that he opened the door to everybody, every bloodline, every people, every language, every nation, to receive this blessing of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, born of God, born into the kingdom of God. We are born into the kingdom of God by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you choose not to repent and reject the gospel, you're not getting born into the kingdom of God. That's where the temple authorities were in the first century, and that's why Jesus cursed that fig tree. He cursed Israel because there was no fruit to be had. Here's the Son of God, the parable, the owner of the vineyard. I'll send my son, and certainly they're going to listen to him. No, of course not indignant that's the wrong state of mind to have in this time of lent it's about a turning of the heart it's about what the taxpayers uh, taxpayers tax collectors well taxpayers too tax collectors and the harlots did at the time of jesus just believe that he is who he said he is and the gospel he preached Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, of course, makes direct reference to our cast of characters running the temple. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. So this is an example. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Praying in church when you're the only one in church is divine. It's the peace to allow your mind to relax and not think about what you have to do for the day or what you didn't do that morning, but just to be in the moment. Focus on your relationship with your Lord and Savior. Remove all the distractions. Sometimes it might take time for your mind to settle down but it can happen being one with God nobody around not not of course looking to score any points with anybody it's not about that it's about our heart in alignment with God's heart And, of course, the Sermon on the Mount continues, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, 
or they disfigure their faces that may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. <coughs> Excuse me. But to your father who is in a secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And that's where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, having a heavenly perspective on all we do. Repentance is at the core of it. Changing of the heart is at the core of it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The foundation, of course, of this New Testament is the Old Testament. So many timeless truths were presented by the prophets that still speak volumes to us today. God was continually trying to get Israel to turn to him, to repent, to change their heart and minds. And, of course, they would fail to do so time and time again. Here's an example in Joel chapter 2. Now, therefore, says the Lord... Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart, open your heart, not your garments. You know, to rend your garments means you're just to rip them open. God saying, no, 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 no. Open your heart, rend your heart, return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and of great kindness. This is our God. Just like Isaiah had prophesied. Here's the prophet Joel. For he is gracious and merciful. Merciful, mercy, means, okay, I did something wrong. I'm going to tell my God that I did wrong, and he is merciful to forgive you. Withholding of merited judgment is mercy. Slow to anger, of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm or bringing forth judgment. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? In other words, what do we have to lose by returning to the Lord our God, knowing he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, Great kindness. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing. Instead of judgment, who knows? Maybe he'll just change his mind and leave a blessing behind. That's the word of God. God looks on the heart, and that's what the time of Lent is all about. It's our heart, and it's also the heart of God, our God. This is our creator, we call him ours through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what this season is. It's a continual turning, a reflection on who we are in light of our relationship with the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, there is a contrast drawn between the internal and the external. You know how Christ talked about the hypocrites, they would disfigure their faces before men so they looked like they were fasting. So everyone was like, oh, wow, they must be fasting quite a lot. They have their reward. It was about the show, it was the external. God's not interested in the external show, you know. So in Isaiah, we have this contrast. Now, and of course, in the time of Isaiah, it's the house of Jacob, it's Israel. And, you know, they're, of course, 
not doing what God would have them to do. Even when they're trying to do the right thing, it's, it's not from the heart, it's just a show. So Isaiah starts, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. God wants Isaiah to speak up and say, look, enough is enough. So here we go. Yet they seek, inquire for, and require me daily in delight externally to know my ways as if they were in reality a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God in visible ways. Why have we fasted, they say, and you do not see it? In other words, the people are saying, hey, look, God, we're fasting and you're not even noticing Why have we afflicted ourselves? And you take no knowledge of it. Now, there's a really good attitude, right? Hey, we're fasting and you're not even seeing it. We're afflicting ourselves and you're not taking any wrong attitude right there. Behold, O Israel, on the day of your fast, when you should be grieving for your sins, You find profit in your business. Sounds like the money changers at the temple, the money machine. And instead of stopping all work, as the law implies, you and your workmen should do, you extort from your hired servants a full amount of labor. In other words, God says, I know what you're doing, Israel. Your show isn't working. In fact, what you're doing is the complete opposite of what you're supposed to be doing when it comes to the law. The facts are that you fast only for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Fasting as you do today will not cause your voice to be heard on high. Lent is not about a show. God is not interested in a presentation to entertain people around you. He's only interested in what's happening in your heart, what's happening in your mind. One of the things I've been thinking about, and I had mentioned, is not to murmur but to ponder. We can't possibly know everything there is to know about everything in terms of our individual lives and what might not have gone right or what doesn't seem to go right, but all things do work together for good for those who love God and keep his commandments. That's the thought we are to have in our head, not the murmuring and the doubting and the disputing and the debating and the strife. That's fleshly stuff. God says, fasting as you do today will not cause your voice to be heard on high. I'm not interested in what you're doing, God's saying. You're doing the opposite of my will, and when you try to do my will, it's just for a show. So what do you expect of me, God's saying to Israel? Is such a fast as yours what I have chosen? Is true fasting merely mechanical? Is it only to bow down his head like a bulrush and spread sackcloth and ashes under him to indicate a condition of the heart that he does not have? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? Rather, it is not this the fast that I have chosen. This is the fast I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every enslaving yoke. Is not that the fast I have chosen for you? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked that you cover him and that you hide not yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood, this is what God is after. If you're 
God saying, if you're going to do something on my behalf, this is what I want. Divide your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked that you cover him, that you hide not yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood. Afflicting yourself, that's, no, no, no. That, that's not what I'm interested in. Then shall your light break forth like the morning. And your healing, your restoration, and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness, your righteous, your justice, and your right relationship with God shall go before you, conducting you to peace and prosperity. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. In other words, God will have your back. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. Then shall you cry, and he will say, Here I am. And if you pour out that with which you sustain your life for the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in darkness, and your obscurity and gloom become like the noonday. And the Lord shall guide you continually and satisfy you in drought and in dry places and make strong your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. That is what our Lord God is after that is the heart of our Lord God to us and he made it clear what our heart should be back toward him that is the Lord God that we serve throughout the New Testament throughout the Old Testament this is our reality as mankind, that is our God. Like Paul says in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals, they sacrificed before the Lord in the temple. But in this day and time, we are the ones who live our lives as living sacrifices. That's what God is interested in. Paul also refers to it as living epistles. We are to be an open book for those around us. Psalm 51 is a prayer of repentance. It's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after David had made a very serious mistake with Bathsheba. David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now in this day and time, our sin is cleansed by the Son of God through the washing of his blood. Jesus became the sacrifice for all time, for all sin, backward and forward. When we accept him in our lives, the sins we committed before washed away. Jesus says, we are perfected forever 
in the Spirit of God that he places within us, that we are baptized with, Hebrews says we are perfected forever. That's how God sees us. Obviously, our mind and our heart need to track with that truth. That's the ever turning to God, ever turning away from murmuring and disputing and attitude and indignant state of mind and turning toward a humble state, broken open spirit, heart to God. This prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make known to me wisdom. Purge me and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Prayer of Repentance my exhortation and I'm going to do likewise park myself in church in the quiet to soak up the divine atmosphere and just pour out my heart to God whatever is there I want him to know about it in that context so in this time of Lent we think about Our God, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. We only stand to benefit when we keep this in our minds about who our God is. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Those are the words of John the Baptist. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. All these years later, we say the same thing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, from our lips comes the praise to God. And from our heart comes a pure desire to live as he would have us to live. That's what this time of Lent is all about. Like just letting go of whatever is separating you from God. Confessing it to him, releasing it, removing it. Whatever it may be, it's all part of turning to our God. So tonight, it's been my pleasure. It's been a blessing to share this with you. I love the scriptures. I love our Lord and Savior. I love what he has done for me in my life and the lives of others. I cannot imagine life without God, life without Jesus Christ, With all due respect, I just don't know how people go through life and don't see this loving God, don't see the words of wisdom spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. As it says in Proverbs, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We do create an internal atmosphere and an inner dialogue in our heart by guarding, protecting, and maintaining eternal divine truths. We are the keepers of this in this generation. Let our generation be remembered as faithfully carrying the torch that Jesus Christ 
our Lord and Savior lit almost 2,000 years ago. It's an awesome privilege to be able to live in this day and time, to have all this truth available to us, and to have a loving creator who has given us this book to walk in his light. God bless you. On behalf of all of us at WCAT Radio, thanks for listening. Look forward to you being on hand next Wednesday. From all of us, God bless and good night. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.